Hi there and welcome to my lecture video on the different phases and methods of e-learning. If you are a teacher like me and maybe you do not have a lot of experience with e-learning, you never did that before or not a lot, and you now, as we are in the COVID crisis still when this video is recorded, you want to make a new course for your students and do an online course and you will have a look probably on the internet and look what methods you can use, what tools you can use. You might find thousands and thousands of different tips and tools and software and so on and also teaching and learning methods. So that could look like a jungle to you. You may feel totally overwhelmed, lost in this jungle of different tools and apps. But the good news here is don't be overwhelmed because if you take a closer look actually you will see that all these different methods and apps can be distinguished in some basic types and I will in my video distinguish the phases of e-learning too so we can really structure that and we do not have such a confusing jungle of possibilities we have to talk about. You also, when you look at the internet, at the possibilities, you might feel seduced to use a lot of them. You know, you want to burn a fireworks of uh, e-learning methods. However, that's not the point about e-learning. E-learning is learning and teaching, of course. And the methods you use, the software, the tools, how fancy they may look like, they are just the vehicle. It is all about the learning, the learning experience, the content you want to transport and the topics you want to teach and the topics you want the students to learn about. So another thing why you should be careful to use too many methods is that each method, each software tool takes quite a bit of time to introduce to the students. The students, and also you yourself, of course, have to get confident first with that. And that time you spend on that, of course, you will not have to spend on the actual content and topics. And you also may, in addition, confuse your students. So what I recommend is what you should do instead is to create a simple structure, a simple sequence of methods and e-learning phases and stick to them. Also me myself, I was struggling with these different possibilities the internet and the computers give us for e-learning. So I created a circle of three phases of e-learning to make it more simple because from my experience these three basic phases are like a cycle and if we do e-learning especially if we do e-learning that tries to involve the students action-oriented teaching and learning student-centered teaching and learning we kind of have to follow this cycle of three phases the first phase I call the instruction phase because if we teach about a new topic, usually though we want the students to engage very fast and there are also other approaches which first engage the students, I personally prefer that I give the students some information on the topic first. That is what I call here the instruction phase. So an introduction into the new topic, an overview, maybe some theoretical background and so on. And then after that, we should go into a, what I call here, a working phase. That means we hand the staff over to the students and the students become more active, for instance, in a scenario of a group work setting. And then after that working phase, what we want to do as the students did some work, they created some results, they may have to show something, the students should, of course, present what they did in the working phase. 
and not only present, we also should engage in a discussion. We should give feedback to the students. We should ask further questions. Also, the students between themselves should engage in a discussion. So as you see, it's not that difficult. Actually, it's pretty simple. Just three phases and cycle them, do them all over again, and we're done. Well, that would be, of course, nice, but everything in life and in also e-learning is about the details. So let me now go through these three phases more in detail and tell a little bit more what these phases are about. First of all, starting with the instruction phase, as mentioned, you should or could introduce your students into the new topic, into relevant knowledge and maybe also theoretical stuff. And this kind of is like a lecturing in a classroom, in a lecture room, where traditionally, traditional teaching, learning, old school, you are talking most of the time and the students are more the listeners, which is of course not what we want in the modern way, but still we need to do that. It's not totally bad. It has its place and that is in the first instruction phase. So this lecturing, now we are talking about e-learning because before these three phases you also could do in a classroom. You may already figure that out by yourself, but what's so special about it right now in e-learning? In e-learning, uh, in opposition to the classroom, we can rely on different ways of doing that lecturing. We can, for instance, do it either live, like in a live video call with Zoom or with MS Teams or with Google Meet or, or another video conferencing software. So we can meet online live and you can, as a teacher, talk to the students and maybe share your screen with the presentation. But you could also do that like what I am doing right now. You could record a lecture video at home and then just make the students watch that video. That is also sometimes called a flipped classroom scenario. You may have already heard before about the flipped classroom approach. So there are advantages and disadvantages. And as you already see, I prefer that video recording, doing the lecturing, the input, the introduction phase via video for several reasons. First of all, when you have these longer lectures, you may even see that your students are, get bored and get tired in a classroom when they sit in a classroom listening to you. And this, you know, it's not a natural situation to sit and listen to another person for a longer time, especially for young people. Students often are younger. So this phenomena is even uh, worse in the online setting because you are sitting in front of your computer, you are looking at the screen, and then you sometimes cannot hear very well. You all know technical problems happen all the time in that online setting. The, the internet connection is bad, the microphone is not very good, and so on. So especially for longer presentations, you should really consider switching to a pre-recorded video instead of really doing like a one hour lecture live in a video call, in a video live meeting. And another advantage for these lecture recordings is that you can reuse them. You can use them also in additional ways. After the lecture is done, the video is still there, so your students can watch it again. They can watch it maybe several months later when they prepare for the examination. You could also use it in the next year if you teach the same class every year, like usually teachers do. We have always a similar curriculum where we teach our classes every semester or every year. So you can just reuse the, the video from last year or you might update it a little bit and modify it. And you also might share it with other people. So there are a lot of value, uh, values added to these recorded videos. You cannot have when you do just a live Record, uh, live, live uh, video lecture. And especially when you got bigger groups of students, it is recommended because then you have a, a stronger benefit, more students can watch it because one thing is, uh, I also have to mention is that recording videos takes time. It takes much more time to record, especially a 
high quality video now also the talking about the technical quality like having a good camera picture having a good audio see i got a microphone here and so on this takes a lot of time and effort so this effort of course needs to be compensated with an added value and benefit and so as i talked about these benefits also if you have more students and teach this the class several times of course this value added these benefits are stronger and what i just said what is important for the videos if you use the videos you really have to put more effort in the quality of the slides of the material and what you say because people also have different expectations if you know we are used to watch videos on youtube on tv and they are often very very well well made and high technical quality also the people are like you know tv moderators talking like actors and however of course we are teachers we are we can, could also see ourselves as actors because we talk to people we are moderators also but we don't have that professional training on how to you know like a tv a tv a news moderator has or an actor so anyway the people who are watching the videos they got these uh, these hab habits they they compare that automatically with these uh, other videos so we have to at least not you know be too bad at it so that we you know can present ourselves and also because the video is staying there maybe forever you know something that is in on the internet you can stay there forever so we should put more effort in that and also because the channel of communication is limited in a video in a classroom you can look around you see the other students you see my full body now i'm cut off here of course below there i have more body but you cannot see that this is the thing it is all limited uh, the communication and the, the media the, the information channels are kind of restricted so we have to make sure that everything is high quality to get the most through that more narrow information channel through the internet and through the camera lens and through the microphone what is especially important is that and what people often forget because they focus on the picture the video but what is even more important is here what you see here the microphone the audio quality because 80% 90% maybe of the information you get right now comes from what from what i am saying i am using many many more words than you can see on the slides so the information is all about what i am talking about so you also have to really make sure that your audio is very good and of course also the video and you have a good webcam and so on and another thing i before said a video is especially good for longer presentation but on the other hand videos should also not be too long because we give the videos to the students and we cannot control them like if they really watch it from the beginning to the end in a way that we can control them in a classroom where we can see if they are in the classroom or not if they are listening to us or not so we have to really make sure that the video is engaging and in the videos we can see when we look at the statistics of the dropouts of the viewers of videos we always can observe that the longer the video goes the more people are leaving the video so you should make it maybe not as long as a, a lecture which can be in a university uh, setting or in a college could be up to 3 hours depending on the country 90 minutes or even 3 hours we should not go that long so we should split it up in shorter phases maybe make more smaller shorter videos i personally go between 20 to 40 minutes because too short is also a problem you have to cover the content you have to really talk about the topics you have to talk about and if you make it too short it stays too superficial you cannot transport the knowledge you want to transport so you have to find a compromise between not too long and not too short and create really good quality and that also means in that context focus on the important topics select the important information you want to transport The second phase I want to talk about 
of that model I'm using is the working phase and from my point of view this is the most valuable phase at least when you do it right. As a teacher when you can't get it right this can be also a very frustrating phase for everybody especially in an e-learning situation and most e-learning efforts uh, of teachers fail in this phase. So let's talk about this phase and try to get it right. In the working phase, as already mentioned, the students should apply what you taught them during the instruction phase. So this working phase can be organized in different ways, in different settings. Basically we have two types of settings, that is a self-work setting or a group work setting. And in these group work phases or these several group work phases, as I mentioned, it is kind of a cycle where you go through the instruction, working, presentation phase over and over again. For instance, during a semester, you have maybe several sessions with several working phases. You can organize each of them, each of these working phases as smaller work phases, separate work tasks, or you can connect them over a course of a semester, for example, and hence create a project-based learning or problem-based learning setting where you conduct a project over a longer period of time and in the several working phases the students work and they always step by step proceed through the project and then at the end have a, a longer result, a bigger result. And you could even continue that after the course or the, 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 the class, is the e-learning class is finished, I mean the, the lecturing where you meet regularly every week or several times a week in a video meeting and then you give the working phase. After that even the students could continue working in that project by themselves and you might take care of them, not in, in like a live video call session with everybody or uh, every week or so, but you could do like a mentoring and what that is I will tell you later in when I talk about the different methods of e-learning and teaching. So why I mentioned many times teachers fail in that working phase. What are the reasons? How can we get it right? The most important thing is, from my point of view at least, that you really create good work tasks. So you create work tasks for the students or with the students or even the students create these work tasks by themselves with your guidance. By creating good work tasks you make sure that the students are motivated and engaged. So what is a good work task? What does that mean, good? One characteristic of a good work task is that it has to be related to what you teach, what you have taught in the instruction phase and that the students now in the working phase really apply what you talked about in the instruction phase. Another important or maybe two, two important factors here are that First of all, it has to have also a relevance to the whole study program in some way. And what is even more important and most important of all, what I just talked about, it should have a relevance to the career or also the life, the reality of the learners, of the students. So the students understand why they are doing that or why they should do that work task. You all were students once in your life and you remember often we sit in the classroom and we ask ourselves as students, why do I have to learn this? And if we do not understand that, why we have to learn this, with good reason we are not motivated. So that is the, I think the core element of a work, good working phase, create a good work task that interests the students. Another aspect of it is what we call 
authenticity. Uh, it has to be authentic, the worst work task, or it should be. So you should try to use tasks coming from the real world, from the real world in general, or as we are now talking about TVET, from the world of work. And from the world of work, the students will be in the future when they graduate, where they will work. And another thing is how you can create more motivation and add value to the working phase that you also could think creatively with your students on how you may use the output, the result of the work task for the future. And the output means not what the students learn, that is the learning outcome, how we call it as educators. The outcome is what the students learn, but the output is the result. For example, you have a project and the result of the project. Maybe they produce uh, some, some product, this product would be the output. Or they develop something, like in this course we could, or you could as the learners, develop a class uh, an e-learning activity using a classroom activity, transform it into the digital world and the concept of that e-learning class you develop could be the task of the working phase and the, the plan of the teaching and learning you want to do could be the output. So you could use that after this class when you teach yourself and you teach your student on ICT. As I already mentioned before, we could arrange the separate work tasks of a class over a semester and connect them into a bigger work task, like in a project or problem-based learning scenario. Project-based learning and problem-based learning are kind of at the core of student-centered and action-oriented teaching and learning and very good methods we can use and uh, we could also talk about this in a, a separate video or in two separate videos and uh, for that we as this is kind of the gold standard it also requires quite a lot of skills from you as a teacher to really facilitate that and uh, Basically what we do in both of these uh, scenarios, the project-based or the problem-based learning scenario, is that we have one overarching work task in a problem-based learning setting, it is solving a problem. In a project-based setting, it is conducting a project. By the way, the difference between both of them, if you ask yourself, problem-based learning is more related to some knowledge knowledge problem, you know, problem solving, solving some knowledge related issues. So this is something you could conduct mostly in the classroom or the students could conduct that using a classroom, using computers and so on. And it is also a little, tends to be a little shorter than the other one, which is the project based learning. And project based learning is this more suitable to train skills to develop competences and uh, as you uh, already might suspect this is pretty effective for us as uh, TVET educators because for TVET it is a lot about applying skills and so on so conducting projects is a very good method and uh, we can train skills there. So the structuring, as mentioned, we have several work tasks, several work sessions, and then we connect them in an overarching project or problem solving process. And uh, as you maybe already asked yourself, uh, uh, or be are aware that I, I still do not talk too much about software and tools. Maybe you had the expectation that I talk a lot about different computer programs and software tools. That is something that comes later when we talk about the methods. And for these work tasks, just for now, let's leave it at that. There are many different tools available and 
the competence of you as a teacher is to pick the right one. So, uh, as mentioned, there are thousands of them, and we cannot, I, I cannot show them all to you in a short video. So, for you, the competence is as a, a, a ICT skilled teacher to find the right one. But there are some ge some uh, general tools I will introduce you in the next video. But you also have to or should be quite creative to create these working tasks and combine them with the right software tool and also with the right didactic setting uh, in general. And again, though this sounds challenging, actually it's not that difficult because most of the time the group work method is the best and the most suitable one. So you should always try to consider first, can I do uh, some kind of a group work scenario? And I will talk about the group work method in another video in detail. The good thing about group work is that it, in, if we compare it to a single individual work task where every student works on the work task by him or herself, here we can make them work together and the students can, in addition to the skills related to the topic, also train their social, their communication skills, their teamwork and other soft skills. And it also can be more motivating and especially in e-learning where the students maybe sit at home or maybe they sit together in a classroom and you as a teacher are at home far away, mostly probably the students also will be at home. Here the group work also can help to keep the students engaged because they don't feel left alone in their, in their sleeping room, in their dorm or at home in the living room, wherever they may be, where they sit with their computer. So here it also can help to overcome the, the, the shortcomings of an e-learning situation. Basically, there are two types of methods, and now we are getting closer to also software and ICT tools and so on. There are basic, two basic types of methods and software tools. The one is what we call the synchronous, that is uh, video calls, audio calls, or text chat. Synchronous means real time, live, like you have a live video call where you talk together in real time and also uh, online collaboration in a cloud document is a very efficient and especially if you combine it with a video call here you can really apply the ICT tools very efficiently and with a lot of benefit if you can create that setting we can do that in in, in these packages in these working suits like Microsoft Teams or others where we can have a video call at the same time we can open a Word document and everybody can work in the document at the same time. That is a very good method for group work. The synchronous group work with a video call. The groups are meeting in maybe in separate video calls, the different groups and working on their documents and you as a teacher can jump around and visit them and observe and monitor and intervene if necessary. That is very powerful and we should try to get there and target that as our, our method. And another one is the asynchronous type of methods for the group work and the working phase that is not only group work, also individual work. We can have forums, wikis, and we can have uh, email as a tool. We, we can you know, send emails to the students. The students can send emails to us or to, to their other group members. We can assess documents. The students can send us uh, what they did in a Word document. We can read it. We can give feedback and send it back and so on. In the next video, I will talk about these methods more in detail, but these are the suitable methods for the working phase. 
So now let's talk about the third and last phase, the presentation and discussion phase. Here, as the name already says, the students should present what they did during the working phase when they conducted the work task, group work or single work task. And first, they should present what they did. This, again, can be done synchronous in real time, and it should be done synchronous. Otherwise, we cannot do what is very valuable, give feedback and get into a communication process. And if we can get that done, if we really can get first the students to good, conduct a good work task with good results, then present these, present these results in a video call in a good way, then we really can have an engaging communication process where everybody is discussing, asking questions. And that can be really, really satisfying for everybody and, and uh, can make e-learning real fun. But if it doesn't work, it can also be frustrating if the students didn't do the presentation, the teacher gets frustrated, or if the presentation of one group is not very well, the other, the listeners may get bored. So everything has to work together very well, and then we can create a real good e-learning experience. And what would be like the, 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 the top goal, if you really can uh, get the students to not only uh, you having giving feedback, but really the students getting into a discussion with you and even more important with each other. That is kind of, if you could get that done as a teacher, then you really get the, like the, the stars on your shoulders as a certified five star online teacher. And in that phase, so after the students present, we hopefully have some interesting questions. You can give feedback. This other students can give feedback. And the presentation should help, should not be very long, but should help to get a discussion process going where we can really go deeper also into the matter, into the topic. What is important to make it work is, of course, also a, a large share of the responsibilities on the shoulders of the students like always in student-centered, action-oriented teaching and learning. Also, it always only works if the students take this responsibility because they have to contribute, they have to present, they have to ask questions. But you as a teacher are, of course, still the key figure because you can motivate them to do it or you can demotivate them to do that. What is very important generally in e-learning and especially for this phase is that you are a good manager and moderator of uh, the discussion and the presentation. For that, you have to manage, keep track of time so everybody can present. You really have to organize that well. And you also, not only here in this phase, but already in the introduction phase and in the working group phase, you have to talk about the whole process to the student and really make it clear to them what they have to do, what is expected from them, how you will manage the, the time slots and all, uh, so that they really understand what, what they have to do and explain all the process to them in detail from the beginning. And so that means you really have to be a good moderator of, of a discussion and of a communication process. You have to listen to the students. You have to think at the same time and you have to give feedback. And then you have to, in addition, monitor the technical environment, the, 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 the video call software. You have to, you know, facilitate all that maybe. So that is a very challenging task, doing all that at the same time. Multitasking is the, is the word for that. So you really have to have experience and skills in all of that and it may take some time to really get good at it so also that means don't get frustrated at the beginning see it as a as a process as a, as a, a long way and uh, we will never be perfect at that but uh, we can really make a big difference if we really can s facilitate this kind of uh, presentation and discussion phase based on the, the working phase before 
what is uh, finally also important, I mentioned that before, is that you really try to encourage peer-to-peer -peer feedback. That means not you asking questions and giving only feedback to the students, but also the students giving feedback to the other students and maybe engaging in a discussion. And in the best case scenario, that would be you can lean back as a teacher. The students engage in a discussion like maybe group one ask a question about the presentation of group two, then group two answers, and then they you know, get into an interesting discussion on the topic. And you just lean back and you just intervene if necessary, but you know, in the best case, you just let them engage in the discussion. But this is of course difficult because mostly when we try to do that, especially in the first time, at the beginning and the students are not used to that. Nobody will say anything. <laughs> that is the problem always. We, we try to want to do it as teachers and then nothing comes and we are stunned and we don't know what to do. So we need time, the students need time to do that. And what is important, uh, what I want to tell you, that is a lot about the small details. Sometimes a small detail, uh, you prepared it maybe wrong or sometimes a small thing the students didn't really understand and in addition it's also the teaching and learning culture if the students are not used to do that to be active to do, they are usually not expected to 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 ask questions or to give feedback to other students that of course takes time uh, to 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 also change the teaching and learning culture however if you engage on that way, I can promise you, after some maybe first difficult experiences, you will have a very positive and satisfying experience if you really can get that going after a while. Everybody will be, I think, very happy about that. I think it's very important to talk about feedback because this is the thing that makes a difference between student-centered and teacher-centered learning and also effective and efficient teaching and learning in general and especially for e-learning. We have to really be good at giving and receiving feedback. So we are the teachers and here you see the students and as I just said, it is not only about giving feedback. Don't misunderstand it in that way. Of course, we have to give feedback to the students, positive, maybe sometimes negative. And I will talk about rules of feedback later on in another video. We have to give feedback to the students. But in addition to that, for creating a good learning experience, and please now open your ears. <laughs> this is where, what, what's the difference and where we, we struggle most of the time we need to become good or need to become as teachers better at getting feedback from our learners. And in addition to that, even more as talked about in the last slide, we also should try to facilitate and motivate and engage, helping the students engage in giving feedback to each other. And that is called peer to peer feedback. So now we're already almost at the end of this video on the basic phases of e-learning, the three phases I introduced you into introduction, working phase and presentation and discussion. And as mentioned, it is a cycle. So you can go through these phases over and over again, depending on how long your course is over a semester. You might go through that many, many times through this cycle. And this gives you an easy structure to develop e-learning courses. And if you look at the agenda of this course, you will see in this course, you also just go through these three phases. We have an introduction, we have a group work, and then we have a presentation and discussion. And then it starts all over again. This makes it much easier for you. You have a simple structure, then you can think about the details. And what's even better that this basic structure, this cycle of three phases is also the basic structure, the cycle of the group work method. I will talk about 
in the video on uh, e-learning methods as the very most important method, the group work method. This also goes through the same cycle. So it is actually quite easy for us to have this simple overall structure and then we can use that structure and really fill it with the details. And uh, we have really now the energy and the focus and the time to talk about these details. And these details, that's where it's, it gets difficult because it's all about the very many, many, many details. And if you expect that in a course, you know that if you have a course on e-learning that the teacher just gives you a lot of different software, that's, that doesn't help you in any way because you need this structure and then you need to think about a lot about pedagogical stuff and then at one point later on you think about the software you use or you just might use one big software package like Microsoft Teams that help, does everything for you. So we will talk more about that in the next video on the e-learning methods, which software you use for this, can use for these different phases and which is the best one or which, the, uh, which types of uh, tools we have available. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that was interesting to you and see you on the next video.